This is the Mathematics Education Podcast from MathEdPodcast.com. Welcome to the new season of the Math Ed Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. I'm your host, Sam Otten, from the University of Missouri. And with me today is a return guest, uh, Dr. Kevin Moore, who's an assistant professor of mathematics education at the University of Georgia. Kevin, thanks for coming back. Oh, thank you for having me back. Really excited to be back. Uh, we're going to be talking about Kevin's article in the current issue of the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education, and the article's entitled, Quantitative Reasoning and the Sign Function, the Case of Zach. And this continues some work, Kevin, that you've been uh, publishing on recently. Last year, you talked about an article that you had in Educational Studies in Mathematics. Um, That was episode 1313. So we're going to kind of dig more into the same sort of cognitive space, the same sort of intellectual area. And a lot of this work uh, analysis that you've been doing is based on a teaching experiment that you were conducting uh, related to precalculus and trigonometry and quantitative reasoning. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that teaching experiment. Yeah, so this was set in the context of uh, Marilyn Carlson's pre-calculus project out at Arizona State when I was working on my dissertation. So as part of that, part of that project was uh, in the curriculum development was to try to develop research-based curriculum. And so we conducted a bunch of teaching experiments, and I was lucky enough to be given the trigonometry module as uh, my area of, of focus for my dissertation study. And so for that, we kind of sat down and looked at the threads we were trying to build the course on and said, all right, let's see, you know, what we can do with quantitative and covariational reasoning in the context of trigonometry. And so I chose a couple students who were taking the course at the time, you know, worked with them for, I think, about five weeks, if I remember right, uh, you know, multiple sessions each week with three students to kind of start with, start off at angle measure and kind of just build up through trig functions and explore the different contexts by which we use trig functions. Mm -hmm. And in the literature review that you had in this uh, JRME article, um, you talked about how there's some kind of limitations in especially United States students in their current understandings with trigonometry. And this teaching experiment, you're really trying to sort of strengthen the foundation for trigonometry and that kind of reasoning. Yeah, you get a lot of uh, of difficulties. Not only, you know, obviously students don't typically develop strong connections across the context of trigonometry, you know, right triangles and unit circle for those two examples. But also within those contexts, you know, they really develop impoverished understandings. I think any teacher that's tried to teach trigonometry sees that, you know, repeatedly with the students. So our goal became, you know, what can we do to kind of mend not only the gap across context, but also within each context to develop really meaningful and strong understandings. So looking over the kind of the literature that's already been done on trigonometry, we kind of pulled out that angle measure had been somewhat ignored across the literature base. It had been mentioned as some places where students were struggling. But we kind of thought about and drawing on some of Pat Thompson's work, well, maybe that's a critical piece we can start with. And then obviously bringing in a lot of literature that's come out recently on covariational reasoning and quantitative reasoning, can we also build that in and really link those two pieces together to kind of come up with a meaningful approach to trigonometry? So basically doing some covariational reasoning about angles and how sort of horizontal components, vertical components relate to each other can be a real strong foundation is kind of your hypothesis. Yeah, yeah, right. You know, so trig functions can kind of come from the mental activity that would be associated with that. Uh, And we kind of conjecture, you know, doing that sort of stuff, then you're really no different than exploring other functions. You can kind of use that same sort of reasoning across those with trig functions just being a subset of a, you know, particular covariational relationship. Mm -hmm. And to really set that foundation so that trig understanding is more than just Sokotoa. I feel like I feel like I've I've uh, met or encountered students um, where Sokotoa is like the beginning and the end of their trig understanding. I think I was at that point when I got this uh, assigned to me as my module. (laughs) I think it was a comprehensive question I got given me. I'm like trigonometry. I'm like, oh, (laughs) I don't know about this. Right. Now, you've done, like I mentioned, you've done a few um, different analyses, or you've kind of been building on some analyses that you've had from this teaching experiment. I was wondering if you could just help us situate this current JRME article with um, your previous articles that you've published. Yeah, so the angle measure article is with the same, the same students, particularly Zach and Judy in that article, and then this article built on just, just Zach himself. And so with the angle measure article, that was presenting the pre-interviews uh, in the first two teaching experiment sessions and then also building off some of the later interviews 
And so the JRME article, this one with Zach, picks up, you know, at the third, basically the third session and exploring those next couple sessions of the teaching experiment uh, for when we started into trig functions and kind of developed through there. So, you know, it's kind of the two articles pieced together give kind of a story from the beginning to the end of working with uh, Zach, really. Oh, great. So as we get ready to dig into that story, could you tell us a little bit more about Zach? Yeah, so Zach was a pretty interesting uh, interesting case as just as the subject that he was. So at his time, he was, uh, gosh, early 20s, I believe, an ethnomusicology and audio technology major, which is, mm-hmm. uh, you know, you would think was not common, but at least at the uh, university which his data was collected, uh, the pre-calculus students range all over the place. Uh, mm-hmm. pre- most majors require at least up through pre-calculus, so you get a wide, wide range of students. Okay. Uh, but what was really cool about him was he had taken calculus a couple years prior to the study, but coming back to university where he, I don't know if he had dropped out of the previous college or what had happened, but coming back to university, he wanted to drop back into pre-calculus because he had struggled so much and also for his major. So he made kind of a cool subject just to have, you know, one of those still younger students, but also had been through the ropes a couple times. So that was that made him kind of interesting to work with. Mm-hmm. And then as you had Zach involved in the teaching experiment where you had the five sessions where you worked with him and some peers, um, you also did some interviews with him. I was wondering sort of what approach you took to actually build this case of Zach. Yeah, so obviously within the teaching experiment, you have ongoing analysis where you're continually documenting how you think the students are thinking. You're designing tasks based on that and implementing them to kind of continually revise and refine your models of their thinking. Uh, but that's all ongoing during the teaching sessions, you know, lots of late nights watching video and meeting with the, the observer that I was working with. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then the important part is really in the uh, the retrospective analysis where you take the whole data set, including your hypothesis that we're going along the way, and you kind of dig back into the data chronologically and build up through it and start building models of, their think- of his thinking. Uh, so that required, you know, starting from the beginning again and kind of going through and watching the video and really articulating how I thought he was thinking then comparing that to the notes that we had taken at the time about how we thought he was thinking and really trying to dial in and develop a viable model. Uh, and then as we thought, you know, we had a good handle on of, of watching a day and say he's thinking like this, then looking across the data and trying to find uh, evidence that would contradict how we thought he was thinking. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, so rather than, you know, looking and cherry picking the data for what you think, you, you know, you do build cases of how you think he's thinking, but then really critically looking at the data and try to find something that contradicts that. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of the process I took uh, about going about this data. And do you feel uh, pretty confident in what came out of it, or were there still some sticking points where you really kind of weren't confident in your interpretation? I mean, I definitely think there's, I mean, any study I can think about that I've done, there's always points like, wow, I wish I would have asked this question, or I should have followed up on it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, or I th- this is what I think now, and, you know, five years ago I wasn't thinking that. Uh, so yeah, there's still there's still open questions, and some of the things he did, I wish I would have dived, would have dug a little bit deeper. And so that's again part of the process is you know being open with that that hey, this model that I provide is in no way isomorphic to his thinking. You know, rather with it's with the available data that I have, you know, my best conjecture about where he was and what I can take away from his activity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was lucky with Zach though, particularly of you know a lot of the students I've worked with. He's been one of the more uh, concise and you know articulate students and very much a you know what you might call like mouth vomit student where he's very he would think with his words uh so he wasn't real super internal you know where he'd sit around for two minutes so that made it a little bit easier to be comfortable with the results because he was so articulate and so open with his thinking i'm speaking with kevin moore from the university of georgia about his current article in jrme And so I was wondering now if you could take us through the case of Zach. So you're looking at Zach's quantitative reasoning as he's working through this teaching experiment on uh, the sine function and trigonometry ideas in general. So where did Zach start from, and then where did he kind of move throughout the teaching experiment? So Zach started in a pretty typical place of all the students and even the pre-service teachers I'm working with now. When he came in, you know, angle measures were pretty much labels of objects. I kind of mentioned that in the SM paper a good bit, that there wasn't really a measurement process behind that. So starting with it, you know, we jumped into angle measure and really developed an arc length approach, uh, which he grasped onto pretty, pretty fluently. Now, where that became really, really beneficial is when we went into circular motion, which was the next step, uh, he immediately connected with circular motion with an angle measure and an angle of rotation and thinking about an arc being swept out. So that was a pretty natural connection for him to make. 
with that said, when we also talked about, you know, coordinating like a vertical, a directed vertical segment with that varying arc or angle measure, he started out definitely engaging some conversational reasoning, mainly directional. So think about is it increasing and decreasing and increasing and decreasing and so forth uh, about that. But then what was interesting was, you know, him and the other students as well, each drew a curved graph. Uh, and then my follow-up question is that on the curved graph was, well, they haven't really developed any covariational reasoning beyond thinking directionally, so they didn't, didn't initially have a good justification for why you might not use uh, linear segments for a graph versus a curved graph. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that, I think that was really a critical part in the teaching experiment, uh, particularly with him, was when we hit that and I posed, you know, I posed the linear graph, that kind of turned a switch on in terms of covariational reasoning that he kind of jumped in and said, well, you know, maybe we should consider, well, it's not linear, so it wouldn't be a constant rate of change. And from there, he made the movement to start talking about him and comparing amounts of change and uh, rates of change. So at that point, you know, that kind of turned and he jumped on that really, really quickly. And uh, what was beautiful then is that pretty much became his way of thinking that he carried forward. So, you know, an example of that is the interview task when we're working on the, uh, I believe it was a Ferris wheel situation, where he just spontaneously used covariational reasoning to attack the problem. Whereas during the teaching sessions, it was forced in the sense of I had to kind of probe and provide a, uh, provide an example or a counterexample to get him thinking covariationally. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was a really, really int- cool switch that happened where that just became his way of operating moving forward. And if listeners are interested in these tasks, um, you can look to the article and get some more details on them. There's the fan task where you had like a bug riding a fan blade as it goes around, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, and a ski trail, a, a circular ski trail where the skier is kind of moving a certain amount of distance, which basically ends up being kind of the arc length. And you're saying that those ones gave you a chance to sort of work with him on those ideas. But he kind of, he sort of took over the reasoning himself and maybe kind of internalized it. I don't know if you'd use that word, but um, when, it, when you got to the Ferris wheel task after that? Yeah, yeah, I think, you know, after that kind of first example, he found it to be a, uh, he had kind of one of the, oh, that's cool, when it went on the fan problem the first time that he encountered it. You know, he was like, oh, that's cool. You know, that's a cool way of thinking about it. So, yeah, you know, you could say he can internalize it immediately, and then it just became the way in which he assimilated moving forward, which was, you know, fascinating. I did not expect that at all, but it happened to be the case with him, as well as uh, the other student, Judy, was very similar. Mm-hmm. Now, a lot of teachers uh, or textbooks as well in trigonometry will start and really build up the trigonometry ideas from a right triangle basis. Mm-hmm. Um, and in Common Core, even, I think uh, you mentioned the article that Common Core kind of starts with the right triangle um, definition mm-hmm. to these trigonometric functions. So then I was wondering now about how you could take Zach and how it went um, as Zach went into the right triangle situation after having done the sort of angle measure and then the circular context. Yeah, so it became very natural to Zach for several reasons. One is, uh, so in addition to covariation, he had developed the radius as a met, you know unit of measure. So measurement was very central to his uh, basically sine function scheme, so measurement and covariation. So when he went to the right triangle situation, he immediately tied angle measure to arc length, so that kind of gave him a natural way to situate a right triangle within a circle, even though he didn't have to draw a circle. But then he also immediately saw the hypotenuse then by what a unit as a unit of measure, you know, which he mm-hmm. essentially envisioned as the radius as well. Mm-hmm. And so once he saw that, he basically he had a real nice quote in there. You know, he said, "Wow, you know, I never thought about the hypotenuse as a unit of measure before, but now that I understand it is that I just measure the other legs relative to the hypotenuse, and so from yeah, wow. that kind of emerge, you know, your opposite over hypotenuse or your adjacent over hypotenuse." Right. Uh, and like, same, how much of the hypotenuse are you how are you having here? So that's, of course, why you would divide them like that. Exactly. And then also, you know, he just saw the right triangle as kind of an instant instantiation of the covariation. It was just, you know, one specific pair of input-output values. So that's kind of one of the benefits of starting with covariation first is you kind of capture something dynamically. Then when you move the right triangles, you can just treat them as, you know, one specific pair of input-output. You know, each right triangle and the similarity across them. So, Kevin, you've been working for a few years now on uh, these ideas of students in pre-calculus and their quantitative reasoning um, and how that relates to measurement and covariational reasoning, um, some specific content of these trigonometric functions. So thinking about the Ed Studies article last year, the JRME article this year, or just the the body of work overall, um, what would you say are some things you feel you've learned in this area? Um, But then also what questions do you still have that you want to explore? 
Yeah, so one of the things I definitely feel I've learned is definitely the benefits of uh, that quantitative reasoning can play in students learning the mathematics, that it not only gives them something that uh, they can kind of grasp on because, you know, it's experiential and they can go through it, but it also just ena- enables them to uh, create like a foundation for abstraction, that they're able to, you know, dive into a situation and really develop some rich mathematics from it, and it becomes very fluent in kind of their own mathematics. You know, that's one of the things I wasn't, really expecting going into it, just to see the, the, the uh, personal meaning students take for the mathematics when they get that opportunity, mm-hmm. which is just, you know, cool to experience as a teacher, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. And so, like, with Zach, the feeling that he really had a way of thinking about this versus, like, uh, the Sokotoa, uh, it's not really a way to think about trigonometry, it's just a way to compute certain numbers, um, where it seemed like with Zach, he actually had a way of thinking about it. Which is a lot more, a lot more powerful. Yeah, exactly. And him and, uh, I mean, that's where you know I had three subjects. Him and Judy were both like that, and, and they took the mathematics then very personal, where they had no problem arguing, you know, with me or with each other about what was going on. You know, that they felt like, hey, this is my mathematics. I have a solid understanding of this. I'm going to wrestle with you until I feel comfortable with what our conclusion is. Where the third student in this, in the subject, was definitely more of looking for the road, road procedure. Uh, she asked me, you know, multiple times, you're the teacher, you're just supposed to tell me what to do, sort of thing. And, she, you know, so she never developed that personal attachment to mathematics, and she didn't want to wrestle with the other students or make arguments or throw conjectures out. It was very much a, just tell me what to do, and I will practice that over and over and over. So it was kind of cool to see that difference where the students had, you know, really dove in quantitatively that that was kind of a byproduct of that. Mm-hmm. Other things that you've taken from this work? Yeah, so... Kind of thinking about how I've extended this moving forward, one of the, uh, you know, an open question that I've taken from this work is, okay, this is beneficial for these two students. You know, now what about in the grander scheme of things when working with teachers, both in service or pre-service, or with just other students, you know, at the uh, secondary level when they're first approaching trigonometry? What would happen, you know, using approaches like this when you're you know, a student's first encountering trigonometry, and also how to work with teachers who have, you know, maybe taught trigonometry for 25, you know, 30 years and use SoContoa, how to work with them on, uh, you know, maybe taking this sort of approach to teaching trigonometry. You know, I think those are two huge open areas of inquiry. Mm -hmm. To me, it just seems so much more rich to be thinking of trigonometry as this dynamic relationship between covariant quantities, where it actually has this kind of measurement basis, Mm -hmm. and you can connect across the context of circles and triangles rather than Sokotoa, which to me is basically just a way to take numbers and use arithmetic operations to give some outputs. Like, okay, you take these, divide them, you get that. Right. And like you say in the article, I think you cited uh, Keith Weber, you say really trigonometry is kind of a, a first important departure from just arithmetic operations. Right. And so to try to ground it all on Sokotoa is to me like trying to it's trying to stay in the world of arithmetic when really this is a big mathematical departure from arithmetic. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point, right? That you're you're definitely taking it back into hey, here's another function we have a formula for, where you know most functions that we have to deal with, especially as you get up into high school mathematics and beyond, it's more about the mapping that's there or the simultaneous uh, pairing and the covariation that's there that needs to be grasped because you get into such complex functions that don't have corresponding you know just square it and add two sort of stuff. So that, I think that's where the quantitative approach gives them. And this is Keith, one of the points Keith made. You know, they, they need to have the geometric tools to deal with trigonometry, and I think a quantitative approach can accomplish that. You know, it turns the unit circle into something that's really, really powerful. Basically, Zach and as well as some pre-service teachers I followed up with, developing a unit circle is basically any circle can be conceptualized as it, as long mm-hmm. as you conceptualize the radius as a unit of measure, which is really, really powerful. Mm-hmm. So speaking of taking a measurement approach, and in the article, you know, you and through the teaching experiment and Zach, you really use the radius as this measure. And like you're saying, you know, with a unit circle or with an arbitrary circle, you can use the radius as a measure. Then would that lead you to support the tau movement, where the radius is really used as the measure, so you have the ratio of the circumference to the radius, rather than that old pi thing where it's the circumference to the <laughs> diameter? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do think there is some uh, legitimate arguments within that, particularly that relationship, you know, that between uh, the circle and the radius. Now, of course, on the counterpart, I've heard people say, well, but the circle to diameter is more natural because you can find the diameter pretty easily on a circle if you're given it, where finding the radius is a little bit more difficult. 
Mm. Uh, but of course, if you can find the diameter, then you can find the radius. Okay, just, that's exactly. You know, with right. no, exactly. And, and at the same time, uh, there's a good argument for tau because when you use two pi, if you're using like computer software, you can get in the larger round off errors because you're basically doubling your round off error. Oh yeah. You use by doing two pi because you're using pi as an estimation and then two times that, so you're doubling the error. Where right. if you use tau, you know, you're estimating based off that. It's oh yeah. I didn't. Yeah, I hadn't even really thought of that that so, sort of precision aspect of it. I was thinking more of like, to me, conceptually, it's nice for one revolution to actually just be one tau instead of two pi. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's definitely some uh, groundwork being laid there. So there's some momentum. Yeah. <laughs> there's a, a long tradition that would have to be overturned, though. I'll, I'll post a link uh, in the comments to this episode <laughs> if people are interested in learning more about tau. So my guest is Kevin Moore from the University of Georgia. We've been discussing his article, Quantitative Reasoning and the Sine Function, the Case of Zach, um, which appears currently in Volume 45 of the Journal for Research in Mathematics Education. Kevin, thanks again for coming back um, and being a guest again on the podcast. I do have one more question I want to ask you. Um, I always like to end on a little bit of a personal note. So here in the first episode of 2014, I was wondering if you had something non-work related uh, planned for the year. Yeah, actually I actually have a couple things that I'm going to be doing that, are, that I'm pretty pumped up about. Uh, one of which I'm going to head over to England, to Nottingham, with my wife to visit Lainey Bradshaw. She's a colleague here that's up in the assessment. Uh, she's a professor up there. Works a lot with uh, Andrew Ejok, who I think you actually have a podcast coming up eventually with those Yeah, they, I think they'll actually be the next episode, 1402. Yeah, so I'm gonna. My wife and I are gonna go over and visit her for seven days. She's over working with the Shell Center actually in Nottingham, which is pretty exciting. They've done some oh. cool uh, mathematics education tasks and stuff. Oh, that sounds great. Yeah, so that's one one exciting thing. The second one is I will be uh, I will be on caddy duties a little bit this summer. I got a former friend, well, current friend and former roommate teammate from college and uh, high school, Blake Sattler, who's playing out on some of the mini tours on golf. Uh, some of jump on his bag for a couple tournaments while he's down this way this summer, which is uh, a lot of fun for me. It's work for him, but it's just vacation for me getting out there on the golf course and (laughs) getting to see some pretty good golf. So if people listen to episode 1313, then there's actually some dreams coming true here, Kevin. That's right. Uh, Hopefully he doesn't do too well, or I don't know, I might have to uh, change fields. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I think with the success you've been having here in uh, in your work, getting it out into the field, I think that's probably not a good idea. (laughs) But hopefully you have some fun. It sounds like a great time. Definitely, definitely looking forward to it. All right, thanks, Kevin, for being here. Oh, thank you, Sam. Thank you for listening to this episode of the MathEd Podcast. If you'd like to support the podcast financially, please use the PayPal donation button at mathedpodcast.com.